if you're a better person, it brings you a more committed person, but it, it also exhausts you. That was a very uh, difficult period because I thought I was going to die because the tech business is going to grow exponentially beyond your imagination. Hello everyone, welcome to Conversation with Kushal once again. Today we have with us the man who is known as the real estate tycoon. The man who has built one of the earliest holistic townships in India. And the man who loves reading, who is fond of business magazines and the man who started going to the gym regularly post lockdown. Well, on a personal note, he is also a person who is passionate about skydiving and he has mentioned that he is going to get a doctor certificate for that. And you know why his brain runs so fast? It's because he does 10 kilometer marathons very frequently and that's one of the main reasons. And if you want to learn salsa or jive, he's the go-to person. So let's introduce our guest through some witty rhymes. Jiski tum log sab chunna chahate ho kahani. Ye real estate market mein hai bahut bade gyani. Ye actual mein hai bahut bade dani. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani. Thank you so much sir for accepting my invitation. It's an absolute sense of honor for me to have you on the show today. Thank you, Kushal. It's a pleasure to be meet you and uh, also a rank holder in the CA. So it's a pleasure to be interviewed by a CA also. <laughs> right, absolutely, sir. Sir, so according to me, I think that early childhood and early career plays a very important role when it comes to establishing what future you have in your life. Right? So could you just walk us through your early childhood before you started your uh, career in real estate and textiles business? So I've been a uh, son of a doctor, a professional doctor, a ENT surgeon, uh, very reputed. He was uh, Padma Bhushan, he was Dhanvantri Award winner and uh, probably one of the best in, his, in the country at his point of time. So I grew up uh, in a family of professionals and uh, non-business family, to, so to say. And uh, the expectancy was that uh, after my elder brother who became a doctor, that I too will become a doctor. But uh, I, looking at my father's hard work and my elder brother's real hard work in terms of becoming a doctor, I kind of thought that that's not the line for me. I think I needed to take an easier way on. And at that point of time, I chose to uh, do my commerce in uh, Mumbai University. And then uh, there's another story as to how I was uh, conned into becoming a chartered accountant. <laughs> but uh, yes, as a youngster in Campion School in Mumbai, uh, very good school. I got a good uh, sound backing and... Uh, I was a head boy, first elected head boy of Campion School. Enjoyed that uh, part of it in leadership. And uh, it was an uh, interesting time during my BCom in Sydney College. I did a lot of internships in factories. In, uh, I'd gone to Century Rayon. I'd gone to uh, Gwala Rayon. I worked in a handloom factory during my internship in Calicut. And so on and so forth. So I guess at that point of time, uh, got a little bit of interest in the business of business world. Right. And you mentioned that uh, you also did your chartered accountancy course and coming from the same CA fraternity, I understand the pain and struggle, which has been gone to clear all the three examinations of CA. So just a quick question here. What is that one learning or probably what are some of the learnings which CA curriculum has taught you, which is really helping you in your day to day life? And what would be one piece of advice to all the young CA aspirants who are about to give their examinations? First of all, uh, we have to understand that uh, the best part of the CA curriculum is the rigor. The rigor of the curriculum is the most important part and the devil is in the detail. So, you know, you can't skip skim and study your CA. Something which many of the other subjects uh, which I found in my BCom, one could do. And you didn't need to be very, go deep into the subject in order to actually score well. In the Chartered Accountants degree curriculum, I think uh, you really have to be working very hard in order to learn the entire syllabi and also be able to actually perform in the examinations a lot of rigor in terms of perseverance. So the very fact of studying for the Chartered Accountancy course and also doing uh, the article ship, I think a combination of that makes a world of a difference in turning you out to be a better person, a more literate person, but more 
uh, pragmatic in terms of the interaction with uh, the world of accountancy. So I think uh, education, the, the, the working process and the way the curriculum and everything is created, I think gives you a great insight into all this. So it makes you a better person. It makes you a more committed person. But it also exhausts you. Funnily, during that study course, I was addicted to coffee, black coffee. And I would have thermosfuls of that during the period of uh, the study process that I did. When I finished and passed my chartered accountancy, I gave up drinking coffee as a normal habit. And I do take coffee once in a while. But I back to tea because it reminds me of my examinations even after 45 years. So <laughs> all this and more in terms of it. But I think the way the Institute has created the curriculum and the upgradation of the curriculum that takes place from time to time and the continuous teaching and learning processes that we follow post-qualification, I think a combination of all that really makes you into a better professional and a better human being also. Right. So a combination is fantastic. Absolutely. And any one piece of advice for all the young CA aspirants who are watching this? I think uh, advice to students who are there in the profession is uh, really to start loving what you learn. Because, you know, what tends to happen, you try to think of it as it's against me and all. But the moment you get involved into it completely, it grows on you. And the subject really becomes easier and easier to learn once you are actually passionate about the idea. So instead of really looking at it, oh my God, this is Himalayas I have to climb, and to say, wow, this is the Himalaya to be to climb. And I think that attitude will make it easier for you to appear in your examinations and pass it. And also in life, whenever you get challenges, you actually say, it's a challenge, but uh, it's actually an opportunity to bring out the best in me. Right. And I think life is all about that. Absolutely. That's very inspiring. And after you cleared your CA and you started your profession as an accounting teacher, I was just going through your journey as well. In 1981, you like were teaching at ICI itself. So, and then you transitioned into two different businesses of textiles and real estate. And finally, you shut down the textile business because of 100% wage hike asked by the labor union. And you finally chose to go to the real estate business. So, at that juncture itself or before that itself, how difficult was it for you to convince your parents to start something of your own and not get into the medical line? Very tough. Uh, first of all, from medical uh, to chartered accountancy and from charters accountancy, teaching, learning and profession to uh, entrepreneurship in terms of it. I think uh, all that was scary for my father, my parents and the family. But I decided to take up that. I always thought that uh, it would be very challenging and exciting to get into the world of business. <sighs> Believe you me, I never knew what the world of business was, except for that, it, uh, you know, from the outside, it looked very uh, interesting and uh, happening. But when you get down into the actual part of it, it is very different. And I learned that uh, the hard way, the long way. But uh, it's been an interesting uh, upward uh, climb with its pitfalls, with its hurdles, with its challenges, with its impossibilities. And I think uh, all in all, I've uh, been able to be the best of myself in the entrepreneurship role. So while the teaching is uh, still exciting, I still teach, uh, not to CS students, but to many other students, right from primary school to PhD oh, wow. students and all. Uh, and I do it a lot into institution in the IIT, IIMs and others. I've had a lot of opportunity to speak everywhere, including TED Talks. But uh, long and short, what I want to say is that uh, the journey has been fascinating, interesting and challenging. But... Right, absolutely. And just delving into the real estate aspect of your journey as well, I was reading that you bought 250 acres of land in Pawent in 1985 and the main vision or the main reason of doing that township was because you were able to find out a lot of uh, faults in other buildings. Like for example, if people used to reside in Lokhanwala, so there there was no water supply, there was no electricity and that was one of the main reasons you started, like you thought let's build a township and you bought that land in Pawai. And you'd also mentioned the main source of capital was through hundis and, you know, like friends and family, which cost around 2% per month interest rate, which is exorbitant, even given today's time itself. So I just wanted to ask, like, 
taking this gallant decision at that point of time it's absolutely very courageous but what was your thought process going out at that point of time which led you to take such a bold decision today well entrepreneurship is about the leap in the dark at various points of times in life and that was one leap in the dark which i did take but the idea was a dream actually a dream a vision in order to do it and uh, as you said correctly uh, when you make uh, an infrastructure i dreamt of making a township which was there of course nothing like i actually made but at that point of time yes definitely to make a township with a difference and also to a fact that i would be able to actually draw create and develop 100% of everything so we made the roads we made the gardens we made the schools we made the hospitals we made the buildings we made the it we made the commercial we made a go karting track we made a, a games area we made a bowling alley everything and it was such a pleasure to create each of these items of it some made money some lost money in the initial stages obviously you couldn't make that kind of money at all in fact uh, sometimes we badly off but over a period of time i think the satisfaction to create something which is uh, so beautiful as pavai and then thane and now we're doing panvel and other places is a fact that uh, it gives you a joy and satisfaction second to none and people who come to you and say they are residing there for 20 years 25 years and they are very happy and satisfied and enjoying the quality of life which is uh, probably the best in the country i think gives you a great amount of satisfaction initially of course all these are very challenging but what new enterprise is not and uh, so i took up those challenges at that point of time and and luck has had it with me that it's grown very positively right. not that uh, at various points of time in the projects one thought that one would have to give it up but uh, fortunately we were able to ride those depressions and uh, obviously in 35 years we were bound to have many pitfalls in these projects and uh, but it was a part of the game that i was able to manage and uh, thank god for that right and on a lighter note where do you think the next pava is going to be <laughs> so it's already there in mm. terms of uh, after pavai we have got thani which is even more beautiful than pavai mm. we have the next township which is in panvel we're working at dalibag we're working in kandala we're, we're planning to do we're doing chennai so we have various uh, township projects already coming up and each one of them is a is a passion is a thing which will stand out and uh, hopefully will leave something for posterity Uh, which will say that uh, you know these are beautiful townships where people are happy right absolutely i think across the entire journey there might have been a lot of challenges and hurdles as well as you would have had to go through a lot of struggle phases as well and in fact one of the struggle phases which you had mentioned in one of the previous interviews was at the age of 50 you were almost admitted to the icu almost 23 times and that was one of the most difficult phases of your life so could you just uh, throw some light on this like how was it possible for you to tackle this difficult phase of your life and how did you ensure that you always stay positive during that time that was a very uh, difficult period because i thought i was going to die and uh, obviously I, we couldn't really look forward to too much of it and all but i had already big plans previously so it was that i continued to work on the plans that were there and i thought somebody will one day take it over for me quite soon rather than me continuing to do it but it helped me to look at uh, many of the aspects differently including my other contributions to society which i had already started so we had already started building a school we had uh, got involved into educational institutions thanks to my father and uh, things like that were already there uh, as a platform but post that my recovery from that type of uh, thing was a proactive wherein i do believe that i changed several ways one of the things which i changed about myself was the fact that uh, i decided to give back to society much more so the business of business today for me is about one third of my life uh, one third of my life is business uh, which is real estate and other businesses and one third of my life is contribution in terms of institutional work so i've worked with the uh, maharashtra chamber of housing industry setting up kudai setting up naretco 
being the president of Naredco, being the president of Asucham, president of IMC, and uh, I've contributed by being trustee of 14 colleges in Bombay, six schools, two hospitals, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so a combination between my work, my institutional work, working on the national housing uh, policy, working on uh, the state policy for slums, uh, working on infrastructure projects for the state uh, in terms of it. Uh, so a combination of all the three, the giving back to society, hospital schools, this and that. So that change took place in my life. And uh, even today, I think uh, a huge amount of contribution goes on a daily basis to the other aspects besides my business. And it's such a pleasure to do so. In the education field, I continue to lecture to students of, right from primary school to PhD and other students. And uh, it's a part of my life. So I think a little change that really took place was a higher amount of time, energy, money devoted to other aspects than pure business. I think the attitude should be of giving more and instead of just gaining more. Yes. So once you have that attitude, it's automatically you're going to give back to the society. I did it before also, but uh, not in that much measure as I did it subsequent to age 50. We were doing it, but maybe in a smaller way. That's the yeah. difference. But otherwise, I think the measure at, of giving back has increased uh, hugely. Yeah. And uh, that's such a wonderful thing in my life. Right. Absolutely. Just delving into some uh, couple of technical questions as well. Now, recently, the government, uh, RBI, announced a repo rate hike of 40 basis points and the housing loan are around 65 to 6.75% on an average. So, what do you think would be the impact of this hike in the repo rate to the common citizens and how would this affect the home buying decisions of citizens? In the short run, it will definitely affect the home buying decision because when the EMI goes up, the person who's actually buying it looks at the new EMI rate. And the, but in reality, the, the home loan in 90% of the cases is a floating rate. So, this is going to go up and it's going to come down also. So there's a time when this may go up and may go up by 50 basis points or maybe 75 or 100 also over a period of this year, but it will come back down. So when you take a 15-year loan or a 20-year loan for the purposes of house buying, this actually averages out. So you don't really have to worry about it in the long. But in the short run, it makes a difference because if you have incapability of paying a higher EMI today, you're worried about it. Because uh, you don't have any other alternative sources in order to pay for it. So your house buying will definitely get impinged. You like to buy a smaller flat or a little cheaper flat or whatever it is. But I have not seen many cases where people don't buy because of the interest rate. Because uh, 20 years ago, for example, HDFC home loan rates were 16%. So, and, uh, you, you, know, you know, it must be surprising you yeah. today to even hear about it. That's so, 20, 25 years ago, that was the housing rate, uh, which home loans were there, and people were still buying houses. But obviously, that has changed in more number of people being able to buy at a younger age today than one could do before. And that has made a difference. So, lower interest rates in the short run or higher interest rates in the short run would be a little hesitancy for right. people to buy and it will definitely have, but it doesn't really affect it in the long run. Mm. You're not, not going to buy a house because of the home loan rate being slightly higher or lower. Right. And in fact, like other government initiatives also, which are going to happen in this sector itself, what do you think would be the impact of uh, GST cut rate in this sector itself? Because now the GST collections have escalated. Like it was 1.2 lakh crores in November, December, then the latest one was 1.6 lakh crores, like the highest so do you think that a marginal cut in the GST rate in this industry would significantly benefit the developers at the cost of revenue to the government? So the issue is very simple. Because of the inflationary rate, the Reserve Bank of India has done a monetary policy, which is under the RBI, which is in order to curb inflation to increase the interest rates. That's a normal act done by any central bank all over the world. And this is exactly what RBI has done in India. And it is their job to do it, their duty to do it, and their obligation to do so. So they have done that, and the interest rate hike has taken place. But there is a fiscal part of it, which RBI cannot do. 
but it has to be done by government. And if government wants the GDP of the country to grow in a manner in which the prime minister decides, then you need to bring a fiscal intervention into the economy. The fiscal intervention can be by way of a GST cut. Now, the GST has gone up from 1,10,000 crores to 1,42,000 crores. If you gave a GST cut of, say, 10,000 crores or approximately 7-8% of the uh, collection which is taking place, in reality, the boost in the market will be so much that your collection may in fact go up, not down. Because right. people will tend to, you know, do that part of it and that going to the people will help them in order to have more money in the economy. So we think that uh, if you want GDP to continue to grow beyond 8-9%, then not only RBI having done the increase in the repo rate or the reverse repo rate is important, which it is doing, but the government of India also needs to bring an intervention of reducing GST or any other tax rates could be done. So intervention in terms of petrol prices or any other thing could be done. Or, uh, I mean, they have so many tools in order to do it. So it would be possible to do it because we need GDP to grow. And that becomes extremely important to intervene. So yes, what RBI has done is correct under the circumstances. And... Uh, but we need some intervention from the central government. Right. And you mentioned like 8 to 9% growth of GDP, which is our Honorable Prime Minister's vision as well, to take it to $5 trillion economy by 2025. Absolutely. How realistic do you think is this target? Well, if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, do some intervention in terms of the uh, fiscal side, mm -hmm. I think it will be difficult. But I'm sure sooner or later there will be intervention to do that. There's mm -hmm. a second aspect of it which is not in his control, which is, of course, the Russian-Ukraine war. Yeah. And hopefully that will end soon. And if that ends soon and the prices of petroleum products and uh, edible oils also will uh, actually come under control, I think inflation will come under control much faster. But uh, if the Russian-Ukraine war continues as it is still going on after three months, and uh, I think there's a problem there which is uh, not within our control. So they'll have to do some intervention in order to make the benefit go. Thanks for those wonderful insights. I think that was very granular. So just, you know, like asking about this traditional versus disruptive argument, which is going on like since a lot of years as well. Now, since you're a real estate tycoon, this is one of the most sustainable businesses where if you enter again, like there's a lesser risk of as compared to the tech businesses, there's a lesser risk of uh, falling down. Of course, there's a risk in every business. But as compared to the tech businesses, there's a tech bubble which can get burst or probably after a point of time, the tech can uh, become outdated, etc. So for a young professional like me, what would you advise whether to get into a traditional sort of business like let's say manufacturing or let's say real estate or start something of let's say tech business which can be disruptive at the cost of the risk that it cannot work out. So what should be the mindset for a person like me at this stage? So, the point is very simple. If I was your age, I would definitely get into the tech business because the tech business is going to grow exponentially beyond your imagination. What you're seeing, the multiplier factor of uh, technology which is actually taking place, every space uh, which is technology-driven has taken an uplift position. And uh, all the businesses have definitely taken up on the technology side. So for the youngsters, technology, I think, is a key to be a riding factor for a supernatural growth or a super growth. In the infrastructure space, in the real estate space, technology is equally important. So whether you're doing construction, you need to work on new technologies. If you're doing marketing, you need to have technology tools. If you're doing structuring, you need to use technology to uh, do it. Uh, social media, online platforms, required technology. So I think the next uh, few years, technology is definitely a sounder platform for a large number of people. But that doesn't mean that the growth of infrastructure and housing and other things will not take place. So it's your choice and uh, one can do both uh, in terms of being in the infrastructure field, housing field and using technology to make its growth. Then that is a super thing to do. Or you Take up a pure technology base, which yeah. is there. Today, the values in terms of technology valued in the market is more than the base infrastructure. So on a valuation perspective, without technology, you're not getting a valuation easily. 
So you have to work with technology in order to create value propositions which are very strong. So much against my grain, I would say yes, technology today definitely is upper hand and everything is on top of technology. If you take uh, education, we need technology. If you look at uh, Bollywood movies and all that, a lot of it is technology. The OTT platform in doing it, do it. Netflix is all about technology. I don't think the world is going to be without technology. So you can't undermine the need for technology and its use in the next couple of years is definitely going to ride higher than just base values for infrastructure. But it does not mean infrastructure will disappear. You can't disappear roads, uh, highways, metros, hotels, uh, schools, colleges, and fire stations, everything. So those are also equally important, but I think the opportunity is here a little higher right. today. And uh, in terms of examples in the real estate where you mentioned like technology is required in construction, etc. What would be those tech like? Could you give some examples? Well, lots of it. Uh, whether it's a uh, construction side, whether it's project management side, whether it's marketing side, whether it's accounting side, whether it's arranging for finance, whether it is uh, time planning, there is uh, technology is, uh, gives you an uplift on every aspect of your uh, work uh, in the real estate field. Right. The leapfrog in terms of technology is definitely there. Medical, you know, it's everything, so much in new technology in medical sciences. Uh, which we are having. Look at the vaccine production that we have done. So, we, 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 in our hospital, we are now doing transplants and stuff like that. So, it's all technology driven. Uh, how we do these new uh, techniques which are there, technology is definitely helpful. But that doesn't mean that uh, the medical side of it will not be there. The medical side is equally important. You can't just have a technology guy doing medicine. I mean, doing operative work or robotics, for example. So, we need the base good medical side and technology on top of it. Right, absolutely. Again, amazing insight. So just like before we end the interview, just wanted to understand how does a day in the life of an entrepreneur like you look like, like right from your morning schedule to evening schedule, like how does it look like? How do you manage that? So I'm in the gym. Three days a week, I do weights. Two days a week, three days a week, I do cardio. Once a week, I run at least five kilometers and... Uh, now I also added yoga twice a week to the whole thing. So fitness is essential part of it. Though I not, uh, I don't spend too much time on it, but I do it every day. So that's one. And uh, I, I'm uh, I'm the first in my office morning. So by nine nine fifteen, I'm already in my office, and uh, the start of the day is early. And uh, the latter part of the day is usually. Uh, looking at other aspects of it, which is education, health, uh, various things, including a university, which now I head as a provost. Looking at new lines, we have now started an MBA in real estate, which is uh, doing very well. Response is very good. Uh, we're doing, we put up a new law school and uh, stuff this year. And uh, so various aspects of uh, things are there during the day. Uh, evening, lots of people I interact with entertain also and uh, very busy schedules and Absolutely. teaching in between and uh, learning a lot right. so interaction with people is huge so thank you so much once again sir for your time it was an absolute honor to host you and i hope i did justice to your time and again like thank you so much for taking out your time for this thank you, thank you. Thank you.